some of the lessons that I've, I've I shared with you, um, like I said, we've already, I've already shared the lesson with you, but I'll just reiterate it. These are, because they are, they are kind of principles that kind of are, uh, uh, underline what I do. Um, and I've, what I'm going to give to you right now is I've given this to a lot of pastors um, in groups, see, actually. Uh, I usually give it in groups. I don't give it one-to-one. Um, and, and leaders in the church, small group leaders and stuff like that, these are kind of just helpful principles. So uh, they're not in a particular order. They're just things that I've learned about ministry to people over the years. So number one, this is not going to be a surprise to any of you. The, the gospel drives everything. The gospel drives everything. Uh, we, we enter into the Christian life by faith and repentance, and you live the Christian life by faith and repentance. You don't just get into the castle by, by faith and repentance. You live in the castle by faith and repentance. And um, I told you the story of telling my son to go get bread. I just feel like that's a helpful little illustration uh, when I'm, it's because it is so easy for us to tilt towards instruction and, and we think that if, if we give accurate instruction and good instruction and our teaching is accurate, we've solved the problem of, of obedience. And we have not. We have not solved the problem of obedience until we give them the money in the pocket. They have to get the gospel provision or uh, basically we're just setting them up for colossal failure. Um, the, gospel, the gospel is provision. The gospel is the indicative towards the imperative of God. Okay, that's number one. Number two, <clears throat> action plans and clever strategies. Um, as helpful as they are, they can never replace the absolute necessity of a renewed mind and transformed habits, which we've talked about in a few days ago. Um, and uh, again, two wonderful ways to do this is to daily ask yourself these two questions. What do I deserve and what have I received? What have I deserved? What have I received? Um, helpful to rehearse that. That's, that's the main way I rehearse the gospel to my own heart. So several of these first ones we've already talked about, but let me just remind you of them. Number three, one of the amazing truths about being made in God's image is that we are not only conscious beings, but self-conscious beings. In other words, we have the ability to think about our thoughts. It's an astonishing thing. We can stand outside our own thoughts and think about what we're thinking. Think about that. That's amazing. The do animals can't do that. Um, so in, in mentoring, in discipleship, you are helping believers to stand back from their thinking and to look at their thinking as something that sometimes is not truly them. It's them and that they're thinking it. But sometimes our thoughts are evil and are, have, in, have invaded us, but it feels like it's us. Do you remember, um, <clears throat> remember when in Matthew uh, 16, where, where Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And they said, well, some say this, some say that. And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And what does Jesus say to him? Yeah, he says, basically, this is my paraphrase. This is what Jesus says to him. Uh, Peter, you thought that was you thinking that right now, didn't you? Yes, yeah, yeah that, was, that was my, my wise thought. He said, no, it wasn't me. That felt like your thoughts in your brain, but that wasn't you. That was my father revealing to you at that moment who I am. So it felt, in Peter's brain, it felt like his own thoughts, but it actually was God's divine thoughts entering his mind at that moment. Okay, And then just a few minutes later, Jesus says, I'm going to have to go to the cross and suffer. And, Jesus, and, and, sorry, and Peter pulls him aside and says, oh, no, Jesus, this is never going to happen to you. And right away, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And in other words, my paraphrase is, Jesus says to him, Peter, you think that, uh, that that's just you talking right now, don't you? No, that's not you talking. That's the devil talking right now in your head. So in both cases, I think Peter thought he was having a real insight. He thought he was speaking with insight mm -hmm. both times. But 
But Jesus said, no, that, that thinking right now is from God, and that thinking right now is from Satan. And I think the, the useful thing that comes from that, a principle, is that demonic thoughts and even heavenly thoughts don't always, you know, when you're having God, godly thoughts, you don't hear angels singing in the background to let you know that that's from God. And you don't, you don't feel darkness and, and you don't feel that when the d- devil's talking to you. It just, a lot of times, it just feels in, in your brain like, like your own thinking. Um, and so that's why we have, to, we have to help believers. We have to do it ourselves. But we have to help believers to stand outside their thoughts and think about where do those thoughts come from? That thought, the thought that you constantly have in this particular way, wh- where is that coming from? Um, you know, look at, uh, let me show you two verses really quickly on this, okay? Um, Brian, could you look at 2 Peter 2.19? 2 Peter 2.19, and James, could you look at 2 Corinthians 10.5? Uh, what I want you to notice is uh, thinking can be the master that enslaves us, and sometimes, though, we can be the master that enslaves our thoughts. So there's this wonderful, uh, our thoughts can, can enslave us, or we can enslave our thoughts, okay? Uh, there's, there, in a sense, we, to some extent, we get to choose by our, our faith in the Lord. Um, so notice, notice how our thoughts can enslave us, 2 Peter 2.19. So here, here are, are people who are slaves of depravity. Their, their thoughts control them. Or our, we can control our thoughts. James, um, 2 Corinthians 10.5. You can take every thought captive to obey Christ. Wow. You can take every thought captive. So you can... <clears throat> it, it said, it's not saying somebody else is doing that. You are taking your thoughts captive. So here's a question for you. If we can capture our thoughts, are our thoughts us? If we can capture our thoughts, are our thoughts us? Because the captor is not the captive. The one that captures and the one that is captured is different, isn't it? Um, it's, it's, It's something to think about. The whole way that the mind works and how God has set it up. So, we're, all right, so on, one, on one level, you're talking, obviously, to yourself, not somebody else. But sometimes there are things that have been inserted into our minds that are, are, are ultimately foreign to us but are residing there and kind of make uh, masquerading as ourselves. And uh, so sometimes our, our, everything that we're thinking is, in a sense, us. Can't blame somebody else for our thoughts. But... What I'm trying to hit on is that our thoughts are often inserted in. For example, I mentioned this the other day, that I've often in the past, particularly in the past, haven't, it, it hasn't been recent for, it hasn't been for quite a while, but there was years and years where I, I struggled with self-hatred. Um, and, uh, and I've Still, the lingering effects of that in the way it shows up in my life is I will often be very self, I'll be hard on myself. I'll be hard on myself. And my wife will often challenge me and say, "Uh, where are those thoughts coming from? Do you think those thoughts are coming from God? Do you think that's the way God talks to us? If they're not coming from God, where are they coming from? You know, she won't tell me, she just, that makes me think about it. If, and if they're not coming from God, if they're coming from the devil, then why are you listening? Why are you listening to the devil? That doesn't sound like a very good idea. You know? I mean, we need, we need, to, we need to do this with our people, and we need to do this with ourselves. Okay? Uh, number four. <clears throat> Leaders and the church's most faithful people are usually cared for the least. Depend on that. The leaders and the church, church's most faithful people are usually cared for the least. Yet they are the most essential people to invest in because they are the multipliers. So I would just uh, plead with you, don't just spend your pastoral ministry putting out fires and dealing with people who are in trouble. 
You have to do some of that. <clears throat> but you could spend all your time putting out fires and, and trying to help people who are deeply troubled. Uh, invest. What did Jesus do? Jesus spent way more time with the 12 than he did with the crowd. And he spent even more time with the three. And he spent the most time with the one, John. That's what Jesus did. Let's, let's follow his example. Um, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men. Faithful men. You know, I, I, I say you want to look for people that are fat and hungry. You want to look for the fat and hungry. Okay? This is what I'm looking for when I'm investing in people. I want, I'm looking for the fat and hungry. Faithful, available, teachable, and hungry. That's the kind of guys you're gonna, you want to look for, guys. Okay? Faithful, they're just there. You can count on them. Available, sometimes guys are faithful, but they're not available. You can't invest in them because they're not available. Uh, teachable, we talked about that yesterday, right? If you're not teachable, what's the point? And you want people that are hungry. They, they're, there's a, they have a desire to learn. Okay? So I, I encourage you to, uh, as you go into the ministry, uh, you'll, you'll always have to be taking care of the congregation. You'll, you'll always have to be putting out fires and taking care of uh, people that have a lot of problems. And of course, that's, and I tell people, listen, I tell guys regularly, listen, it's a privilege to do that. It's hard, but it's a privilege. But the easiest thing to not do is to not invest in your leaders. The, the people that are doing well, you think, why would I spend all my time investing in the people that are doing well? They're doing well. Yeah, but they need to be doing better. Uh, so invest in them. That's so, so, such an important principle. Number five, uh, don't try to unravel and understand all the problems of people's past. This is a principle I learned from my father. Take people from their broken past to a, a present grace-filled future. To a grace-filled future. Don't feel like you could, you, the only way to get people to grow is you have to figure out all the problems of their past. And my dad always used to say, remember the woman at the well. The woman at the well had five men. And the man she was living with right now was not her husband. And Jesus didn't try to, did, Jesus didn't unturn and say, well, let's, let's go back to the first husband and try to figure out how to, what went wrong there, and then we'll go to the second husband after that, and then we'll get to the third one, and then this other guy. And, no, he just took her where she was in her brokenness and took her from there and went forward with, in grace. Okay? Um, that's not to say that there's no benefit sometimes going into the past. I think that there is some benefit sometimes doing that. But a lot of times it's just too complicated, too messy, can't be untied. Only God can untie it. Let Jesus give people new, a new beginning. Number six. Uh, this is a really important principle I've learned, super important principle. We, we discover people's true commitment to, to, to big change in their lives by testing them with small assignments. You, you, can, you can tell how serious people are in, in, toward large areas of their life by giving them small assignments. Uh, many assignments, small assignments that are neglected or done poorly discover time wasters. You have to understand, this is one of the things that man that mentored me said to me years ago. He said, Tim, you have to understand that, that God is not the only one that sends people to church. The devil sends people to church too. You know, there's, there's, Jesus taught that, right? There's the wheat and the tares. They grew up together, right? And sometimes the devil says, oh, that church is doing really well. Hey, Martha, go and mess them up, you know? And, and uh, um, so one of the ways that you discover people that are time wasters. So, for example, we had a, when we were doing the church plant in Japan, there was a woman that came to our plant after it had been established for two or three years. And every time she was there, there was a different spirit in the church. It was a different spirit. It, was, uh, it, was, it troubled me. There was something wrong there. Um, she was gossiped a lot, and she was causing tension between people. And um, 
So I pulled her aside and I said to her this. I said, we're so happy that you're here. Not really, but I was being polite. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> and I said to her, um, but listen, um, I just have two conditions for you if you're going to stay here, okay? Um, there was one lady that was really being drained by her. So I said, I would like you not to have any more contact with her. I just don't want you to contact her anymore. And then when you come on Sundays, I'd like you to listen. You're new, and, and let, listen to what the other people have to say and learn from them. But I don't want you to be doing most of the speaking. I want you to be doing most of the listening. So I said, just two, two simple things. Don't talk to that lady. And when you come to the church, I want you to mostly listen and do just a little bit of talking, but mostly listening. Very simple. She couldn't follow that. Kept contacting the lady, kept talking and causing division in the church. So I just said to her, I'm sorry, remember those two things? You kind of done, haven't done either of them, so you're no longer welcome here. And the funny thing is, as soon as she left, there was a new peace, a new fruitfulness, a new evangelistic uh, power, uh, it was like the church all of a sudden started moving ahead. It was like there was something wrong uh, in the church that she needed to be taken out. So a small assignment discovers what's in the heart. I have found this over and over again. Uh, if, if, I get, if I get the feeling that somebody is wasting my time, the way I deal with it, go ahead, I, let, let me just finish the thought and then, and then ask the question. If I get the feeling that somebody is wasting my time and, and, and you have to understand what I mean by this is I'm not talking about people that struggle and, you know, and, and find life hard and all that. I'm not looking for superstars. I'm not, I'm not, my job is not to invest in superstars. My job is to invest in regular people. But if somebody is wasting my time, that's not good because time is of the essence. Redeem the time because the days are evil. I got to redeem the time, not waste my time. Uh, so if what I do, is if I, have a, if I suspect that this particular person is just wasting my time, what I will always do is I will give them a small assignment. I will, and it might be something like, listen, what I'd like you to do before we meet the next time is I'd like you to read this chapter in this book or, or do, these, do these four things and write it out on a piece of paper or, or do this particular thing. And when you've done that, um, contact me and we will meet again and talk about it. Now you think, oh, that's so simple. A person who is wasting your time will never do the assignment. They will, they will always have an excuse why they couldn't do it. So they'll come back to me and say, oh, well, when are we meeting next? And I say, well, remember, remember, the, uh, remember the assignment that I gave you? Yeah, yeah. so you, you, when you finish that um, and you've done it, uh, contact me and then we'll meet. And they will not do it. If they're a time waster, they will not do the mission. And this is exactly what Jesus said. One who is faithful in, a, in very little, very little, is also faithful in much. The one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If a man is, is dishonest with, with 100 burr, he's going to be dishonest with 100,000 burr. There's a connection. The way, you, the way you treat the little things is the way you treat the big things. That's what Jesus said. So, um, discover, you can discover people's commitment to God and to the process of change by giving small assignments. Um, if you don't do this, you will have, you will, you will gather a bunch of time wasters around you and they will suck the life out of you and the devil will get the victory. Number seven, I already said this to you before, but I'll remind you, we can only give away what we have, okay? We can only give away what we have. If the fire, if my candle is not lit, I cannot light other candles, right? If my own stick of wood is not on fire, I cannot use my stick to light other sticks of wood. In other words, I have to live what I teach. I'm telling you right now, many of the things I've taught you, I, 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 I do very imperfectly. But if I was just teaching you things that I don't spend any time practicing in my own life, there's no use me teaching you because you will not learn it. This is, a, this is the law. Even if you don't know, even if you don't know that I don't live what I teach at all, if I ignore my own teaching, it's a very interesting. God will not bless my teaching. And I, I have found over the years 
that the, par- the areas of my life that I am disobedient to the Lord in, I cannot teach other people to be obedient in. Uh, I, I need to be obedient in my own life for God's blessing to go through that into other people. Number eight. This is, a, this is an encouraging one when you're dealing with somebody that's, that's I, I can tell you, of, of leaders that I've put a lot of time into and who have really disappointed me. Um, Jesus had his Judas and Paul had his Demas. And, and uh, we, we, we all have people that, that we really count on that, that just leave and, and are not faithful. I remember I, a leader that I put hundreds of hours into, a lot of time into. I went away for a vacation, and the day I came back, the first email was from him and his wife, and they had a list. It was the first email that I, the very first thing I, I read on the very first day back from my holiday. And it was 25 things that are wrong with our church. <laughs> 25 things that are wrong with our church, and about, about 15 of them were me. Well, you know, I, as I looked through the list, I thought, well, actually, there's more than that with me. Uh, I could help you. You know, we should meet, and I'll give you another 15 about me. But, but the point is, they eventually, they eventually left the church, and I, I pled with them, actually, not to leave. I said, I said, hey, we can figure this out. Let's figure it out. We love you. Uh, let's, let's figure this out. But they, they, they left, and their, 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 their unfortunate, their life went very, got very, very hard. But here's the, here's the principle I want to teach you, that Jesus... Jesus had perfect wisdom. Jesus taught with perfect accuracy. And Jesus had the fullest measure of the Holy Spirit. And yet people still rejected him. So we can sometimes think that when people uh, drift away or fall away, we we, we will often think that it's, it's we failed. We failed to say the right thing or come up with the right solution or talk to them enough or... We will often, when, when, when we've invested in people and they, they depart, we feel like it's been our problem. But I'm telling you, uh, mentoring failures and pastoring failures are not simply because we lacked enough wisdom or insight. Sin is a very real power uh, that allowed pe- people could be look, hear Jesus directly, could look Jesus in the face, hear the Son of God speak perfect wisdom in the power of the Spirit and reject it. Think about, think about what, what power of sin is in that. So if, if it happened to Jesus, it's going to happen to us. Number nine. This is just the wisdom about how to deal with sin in other people. Learn to address um, incidents you, you understand what we mean by incident? Something that just occurs occasionally. One, occasional one-time failures. And patterns, which are habituated habits. So things that are patterns and things that are incidents, learn to address those in different ways because incident, incidents of sin and patterns of sin act upon the soul in very different ways. Of course, patterns are more serious. So... Patterns are more serious because they're habituated, and anything that's habituated is enslaving the will, okay? So learning, learn to differentiate uh, a, a serious thing that happens once. It's very serious if a man commits adultery. That's very serious. But if a man's been committing adultery for two years, that's a different level. A one-time adultery because he got drunk or something like that, that's serious. You're going to deal with that. But a man that's been, uh, I've, I've dealt with pastors that have been preaching and doing everything and doing that on the side, uh, then that's, that's more serious. Uh, another wisdom principle uh, in interacting with people, number 10. Uh, when, when you're interacting with somebody and you're, you're learning about what's going on in their life, learn to humbly make observations about what you're seeing rather than conclusions and judgments. Okay, before you're absolutely sure of what the real issue is. Okay, you understand the difference? You're listening to somebody and you say, what? so I'll sometimes say this. I'll say, well, what I'm hearing you say is this. 
and this and this. Is that what you're saying to me? I'm, I'm observing what I'm hearing, as opposed to you're saying this and this is this is what's your problem. When I was in when I was in Japan, um, at one point, there was a particular. It, was, it wasn't as bad as the COVID, but it was it was something that was quite serious that was going around. A lot of people in our in our prefecture was was getting it. It was like a it was like it was kind of like a COVID. It was like really bad cold, okay, and a lot of people were having it. <clears throat> And so I, I, uh, I wasn't feeling very well, so I went to the hospital um, and uh, saw a doctor, and the doctor uh, saw me for two minutes. He just asked me two questions. I mean, two questions. Doctors should never ask just two questions. But he asked me two questions. He was in a hurry. He just assumed that what I had was what everybody had. And he, he prescribed medicine for me, which is what he was prescribing to everybody. I went home, I took the medicine, and I, I went unconscious. Uh, and then there's now uh, an ambulance taking me to the, to the hospital. And it turns out that I didn't have what, what everybody else had at all. What I had was a serious illness, and I ended up five, five months in bed uh, with serious hepatitis. Um, but I think I, I've often thought of that, how easy it is for pastors to be like that doctor. To, to come to a conclusion too quickly and prescribe the wrong solution to a person's soul. Don't do that. Learn how to make observations and withhold conclusions and judgments um, and, until you eventually have to make a judgment and conclusion, but wait, make sure that you've taken enough time to know what's going on. And one of the ways you do this is by asking lots of questions, my friends. Ask lots of questions of people. Learn how to ask good questions. Listen to this verse from Proverbs 18, 13. The one who gives an answer before he listens, that is his folly and shame. The one who gives an answer before he listens, that is his folly and his shame. Uh, what does it say in James? Everyone should be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Quick to hear. Okay. That's Proverbs 18, verse 13. Um, <clears throat> number 11. Uh, this is another principle I taught you this week, but I'll remind you of. It is much easier to steer a ship with wind in its sails than it is to simply row a boat under our own power. This is kind of obvious, but um, I don't know if you've ever pushed a car. I'm sure you have. Have you pushed cars that don't, don't work? When we were in India, I remember our cars, we used to drive ambassador cars, and, and they broke down regularly. And I remember my dad, even as children, we would do nothing almost, but we would help push the car. Um, it's hard to push a car down the road, if you've ever done it. It's not easy. It takes a lot of effort, especially if there's a little bit of a hill. It's much easier to have the engine going. It's much easier to have wind in the sails. It goes rather than doing this. This is a lot more work. And so the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential in pastoral ministry. I mean, this, we shouldn't even have to say this. It's absolutely essential in discipleship. The Holy Spirit is essential in what we do. We said this yesterday. I want to underline it. Um, you know, when you enter a dark room, uh, you, you flip on the switch. There's switches over there, right? To turn the lights on in this room. Does that little piece of plastic on the wall make this light go on? That's a trick question, isn't it? Because yes, it does, but actually it doesn't. Plastic doesn't do anything. It's the power grid from wherever Ethiopia gets its power that produces it. It comes through all uh, the cables, and that's why where the, the power comes from ex externally. But without the switch, the light does not go on. And so also. Uh, the power of the Christian life is not in the choices we make. It's not like the little flip. You could, you know, if, if my lamp is not plugged into the wall, I can click it all, I can go click, 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 and the light doesn't come on. It needs, it needs to be plugged into the power. But if it's plugged into the power and I don't click the switch, it doesn't come on. There is this correlation between God's power and our choices that are, is absolutely necessary uh, for the Christian life. I will tell you this, that charismatics, 
Charismatics, as a rule, tend to em uh, de-emphasize the importance of the light switch. They just talk about the power grid. The Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, just wait, let the, <clears throat> let the Holy Spirit move you along and just keep getting a new, a new prophecy and a new, and a new, be slain in the Spirit and let, experience something from the Spirit and let the Spirit just kind of keep moving you along in the Christian life. And they de-emphasize that you have to make choices. Non-charismatics typically make the opposite problem. They, they de-emphasize the necessity of the Holy Spirit. And one of the ways you can see that, they won't, they won't de-emphasize the necessity of the Holy Spirit in their theology, but in their prayer life. You can see it in their prayer life. Their lack, of, their lack of earnest prayer in their life will show you that they're depending more on their own willpower to make the Christian life work than the Holy Spirit. So I would just say it's not one or the other. To get the light on, you need both the power grid and the switch. Okay? Number 12. Um, this is, a, I mentioned this the other day. Let me mention it again. It is essential that people learn wisdom if they are to be mature in the faith. Uh, the, the Christian life is not just a matter of, of, of a fixed code of black and white options. It's just this or that, right or left, red or yellow, up or down. We, 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 we tend to think that the whole world is just a matter of, of A or B. And, and following God or not following God. Oh, if life were so easy to just make it that way. But you know that life's not like that. Life is, again, a whole bunch of different choices. And, and there are okay choices, and there are better choices, and there are even better choices. Right? You know that's true. Uh, in, order to, in order to make the very best choices, you have to have wisdom. But I, I think wisdom is so important for the Christian life and for sanctification. We tend to think that wisdom is just important for decisions. No, wisdom is important for, for living the life. Uh, listen to this. The, where is the most comprehensive teaching on purity in the Bible? There's lots of teaching on purity in the Bible. Where's the most comprehensive teaching? Proverbs. Whole chapters. Multiple chapters in the book of Proverbs are about purity. Whole chapters devoted to it in a book on wisdom. So uh, wisdom isn't just about making good choices and decisions and how, where, you where you should work and how to... Uh, wisdom is necessary for morality. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The scripture says this in Proverbs uh, 3, verse 5. Nothing you desire can compare with her. And it's speaking about wisdom. Nothing you desire. Think of all the things that you desire. All the things that you desire that are good. Think of all the good things that you desire. Proverbs says, nothing you desire can compare with wisdom. Nothing can compare with wisdom. Get wisdom. Get insight. So my friends, do you have wisdom in your life? Have you sought after wisdom? Do you value wisdom? I believe, I, I, I can't speak for Ethiopia because I don't know it well enough, but I can tell you in Canada that uh, Canada, uh, the, 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 the new generation in Canada is very intelligent. They are learning things in grade six that I used to learn in grade 10. It's an intelligent, they, they can do things on their computers that I, I still can't do. It's an intelligent generation, but it's not a wise generation. Simple, basic things about how to make relationships work and how life works, they have no idea about. The difference between knowledge, knowledge not in the way the Bible uses the word, because knowledge and wisdom are often interchangeable in the Bible, but the way the world uses the word knowledge, I say the difference between knowing things, knowing the facts, and wisdom. And I said, you know, John, knowing things, being intelligent, is knowing an awful lot of facts. There's a whole bunch of things you know here a whole bunch of little packages of information that you know. It could be about computers, it could be about uh, business, it could be about theology. But wisdom is knowing how those pieces relate to one another. See? How they fit together. 
when you know that, you've got a wise person, you see? Um, <clears throat> so seek wisdom. As, as, uh, and, and the Bible says, uh, what does it say? Promise, this is one of the promises of God. If any of you lack wisdom, James, James 1 verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, well, that's me. If any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. What a, what a generous offer. God says, if you lack wisdom, uh, just ask, and I will give it to you. Okay, number 13. This is an important one to put kind of in perspective what I do with most of my time. Uh, change, I believe, one-to-one -one encounters uh, can be very powerful. I, 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 if I didn't believe that, I, I wouldn't do one-to-one, -one, and that's what I do with most of my time. But in the end, change must be lived out in community with others. Uh, you, you have heard me say this before, that we all have a spiritual back. We look in the mirror, we only see half of ourselves. And we need other people to remind us of the sin that we don't see about ourselves and to remind us of the grace and the good that God is doing that we don't see about ourselves. Because we're often looking in the mirror and we're trying to discern our spiritual growth like we're trying to discern whether our hair is growing. We look in the mirror and say, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't see any growth. I don't, I don't think my hair is growing. Do you see any growth? I don't see any growth. But it's growing. Somebody sees you after two months, the, your hair's a different length. It's slow, but it's growing, okay? Um, and because we need community around us to help us to see the full picture, uh, without, without a local church, mentoring will fail. Without a lo uh, this, is, this, is, this would be one of my, my issues with uh, university campus ministries, which I think are wonderful, and God is using them, and I'm very grateful for them. But they're not local churches. And they, uh, they, 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 they go almost as far as they should go, but they don't go as far as they should go. They don't go to the local church, which is what God is doing. God is building local churches around the world. He's not building campus ministries. Campus ministry is, is, is very good, but it should be, it should be used to, to, as a pathway into local churches, not a campus ministry that keeps finding leaders and puts them back into leadership in the campus ministry so that we can find more leaders that will grow the campus ministry. We're not, the main goal, goal of life is not to multiply campus ministries, as good as that is. It is a good thing. We're, we're trying to multiply churches. That's what the Bible's all about. So we, are, we, 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 we need the local church, and without the local church, pastoring, mentoring, discipleship, whatever ministry is, it is, it, it will fail if it's not ultimately tied and plugged into the local church. All right, that's thir the first 13, and we have another 12. 